as promised, I wanted to really talk about just a bunch of cool reptiles from North America that didn't necessarily fit into the five great pet reptiles of the same continent. So this video, I'm gonna talk about five reptiles that I think are really cool for a wide variety of reasons. And to get started, I'm gonna talk about one that I don't really talk about this group of reptiles a whole lot, and that is the gopher tortoise. The gopher tortoise, I think might be the coolest tortoise out there for a pretty big reason. So these guys are a tortoise that are found in the Southern United States. They're really prominent in Florida, Georgia. They're also found in several other states um, in that same area. They're actually the state reptile of Georgia and the state tortoise because evidently they have lots of state reptiles in Florida um, of there. So these guys are really, really cool. They're a good medium sized tortoise. Their average like carapace length is like six to 10 inches, but they can get over a foot and a half long. The reason why these guys I think are so cool is that essentially they are a keystone species. And so what that means is that their existence and their spot in an ecosystem makes it so a bunch of other species can all exist in that and they depend on that species to live. And so specifically with the gopher tortoise, the reason why is because of their namesake, the gopher part. They spend a good majority of their time digging burrows, like sometimes up to 80% of the times. In fact, that's the reason why they have their name and it's Gopherus Paul, ugh, Lord, um, Gopherus Polyphirus, Gopherus Polyphirus. The Gopherus, you know, for the namesake of the gopher, the little mammal that digs all the holes that everyone falls into. And the Polyphirus is a Greek giant that lived in caves. And so what that implies is that, like I said, they burrow all the time. Their burrows sometimes can average, they, well, they average in sometimes 15 feet in length and then about two feet and then about six feet down. They've gone over 48 feet long and over nine feet deep. It basically just depends on where the water table is in the areas that they exist. It basically just means is that if they dig down far enough, they hit water and could essentially start digging wells for people. For the most part, these guys exist in fairly sandy soil in you know, old growth oak forests, flat leaf pines, and long leaf pine forests, and then in savannas that they will spend a lot of their time digging burrows in as well. So with all of those burrows and all of those tunnels that they build, this is the keystone part where a whole bunch of other animals, over 350 species, are all dependent on the gopher tortoise burrow, which includes all sorts of mammals, of endangered amphibians, of reptiles, of snakes, um, and birds like the burring owl, but you know, eastern diamondbacks, Louisiana pine snakes, the endangered eastern indigo, all rely on the, gophers, on the gopher tortoise burrows for their survival throughout it. And so because of that, the gopher tortoise, which is threatened slash endangered or vulnerable, depending on where they are in the range, is so important that we make sure that we keep an eye on and give them plenty of habitat. Otherwise, because if we lose them, we lose all of the species that are dependent on them. The last thing that I think is the coolest part about these guys, other than obviously the keystone species, is that they've done a lot of studies and observation on the gopher tortoise because, you know, vulnerable, threatened, we need them for the ecosystems, is that reptiles, as we've now come to see, are a lot more intelligent and social than we initially give them credit for. And gopher tortoise specifically seem to actually exist in large, fairly complex and sustainable colonies to where the distance between their burrows and the shapes and length kind of determine their social structure with the other animals in their lack of for again lack of better term colonies where individual females were actually seen in and out of the mating season going and spending time with other entirely unrelated females even when they would go across other animals other females or male ant burrows to go consistently year after year not dependent on a season or the time of the day or anything else, they would go and spend time with other unrelated female gopher tortoises, which essentially makes people, I know anthropomorphization can be an issue, but there's something going on there that I think is really cool and something that a lot of people just don't give reptiles the proper credit for. And so that's why I think the gopher tortoise is an amazing reptile.
This next one is one that I really don't talk a whole lot about, and that is a venomous reptile. So this one is the Santa Catalina Island Rattlesnake. And what is so special about this one, there's actually a lot really special with this one, but the one that's most famous about it is that out of the over 30 species of rattlesnake or the Crotalus or Crotalus species or genus, family, whatever, Sorry, it's genus and family. That's the crotalus, that's the rattlesnakes. Um, this is the only one that does not have a rattle. So we've all heard the fable about the rattlesnakes losing their ability to rattle or the ones that just are losing them in general, which uh, several people from one of my favorite places, Reptile Gardens in South Dakota, likes to say, I've never heard of an animal that takes directions from its butt to use its face. And which is entirely untrue, but the Catalina Island rattlesnake does in fact anatomically not have a rattle. So generally what happens when a rattlesnake, when it sheds its skin, it comes off and then it lives one last little husk, little bit of the end of the rattlesnake every time it sheds and they can fall off and do fall off. But in the case of the Catalina Island rattlesnake, every time it sheds, instead of adding one more little on top, um, it just completely falls off with the rest of its shed. And so it looks like it just kind of has that little number or button at the end of it. And for a long time, scientists thought they were using it as a way to hunt birds, either to use it as a form of cuddle luring or so it wouldn't make noise as it was hunting. And they thought about this for a number of reasons. So these rattlesnakes are actually pretty small as far as they go. They usually don't get much larger than about two feet in length, and they're actually pretty slender bodied as well. They're only found on Santa Catalina Island, which is their namesake. And when they're documented there, they're seen kind of out in the open. So reptiles as a whole, but snakes in general, are fairly cryptid animals. They don't really want to see. Really when they're being seen, it's for reasons of like thermoregulation or they're hunting or they're trying to get to their burrow or to look for something. You don't really see them out a whole lot unless they're, you know, for thermoregulation, places like that. The Catalina Island rattlesnake has been documented kind of out open and exposed more often than not, either basking, cruising, hunting during the day, and even in trees, which is why they thought hunting birds, roosting birds, day and night. And But there's a little bit something off with that because while they all thought there's reasons why they don't have the rattle, why they're, in, they're found in trees, there's actually more reasons to that. And that is that they found that their diet is mostly mammalian, over 80% mammalian mostly eating native deer mice that are on the island. So if they're not eating birds, why are they up in the trees and in the bushes? Well, it turns out that they're really only finding them in the middle of summer, like the middle of July and August, the hottest part of the year. So they're actually just getting up off the ground and still, off, and still hunting some birds, but they're mostly just getting off the ground and still actively hunting because they don't really seem to have as much fear in general. Scientists now think the reason why is that because there isn't a presence of large predators in large hooved herbivores, which is why they think the rattlesnake evolved the rattle in general, is to warn of their presence so they don't get stepped on by large, you know, mammalians like bison and horses. Because that isn't on Catalina Island, they didn't need to have that. So they either lost it when their population got isolated on the island, or they never had one fully before the rest of them evolved the rattles on the mainland. Um, they are considered critically endangered for several reasons. Number one, geographic isolation. That's it. That's as far as their population can grow. That's all they have. The uh, next one is they were considered pests because it's a venomous snake for a very long time. So they were hunted because of that, as well as the introduction of feral animals, specifically feral cats. If you want to find out what the fastest way to kill an island population is, put a cat out there. They are the worst but if you actually want to do a video about uh, invasive reptiles, and I will not be talking about the Burmese pythons, there's a whole lot of other ones that I think would be really cool to talk about, let me know down in the comments, and I'll absolutely do that one, or I might do it on my own anyway, either way. All right, I cannot do a video about cool reptiles from North America without talking about this one, and that is the indigo snake. So there are six different species of dry marcon, which is the genus that indigos and Kribos belong to, but for the most part, I'm gonna be talking, but they don't all live in North America. A lot of them live in Central and South America. So for the most part, we're really only talking about the Texas Indigos, the Eastern Indigos, and the Mexican Indigos. And for the most part, I'm gonna end up mostly talking about the Eastern Indigos for pretty obvious reasons. But that being said, 
Um, like the Mexican, these guys are the largest and longest species of snake in North America, with the Eastern Indigo being the longest. The longest on record, as far as I'm aware, is a male that was nine feet, two inches long, which is insane. There are some old world rat snakes that can get a little bit longer, but for the most part, the dry Marcon are some of the longest species of colubrid snake, and they certainly are the longest in the new world in general, with the Eastern Indigo being the longest in North America. So these guys get their name, the Indigo, from that super, super dark black to bluish hue that they get, and they look really amazing, which is why they're sometimes called the Blue Indigo and the blue gopher black snake and all these other crazy names, but they're called the indigo snakes. Um, they are, the eastern indigo is an endangered species. The Texas indigo is protected in Texas, but once you leave Texas, they're no longer protected, but they're still vulnerable. And then the Mexican indigos are not endangered or threatened, or at least they're not listed as such by CITES. So they can still be imported from New Mexico all the time. Um, and then the Mexican ones, they have either a yellow, like yellow creamish belly or a reddish belly. The Texas indigos look very similar to the Eastern indigos and the Eastern indigos have that very iconic black iridescent hue with that nice really, really cool looking underneath their chins and under their bellies too. They are amazing animals. And here's a little fun fact that I honestly did not know. Drymarcon, their Latin name, actually means Lord of the Forest, which if you've ever seen the videos or seen one of these things in person, yeah, no, they own that. They absolutely are lords of the forest for their size, for their presence of being a snake, and honestly, how they hunt too. So, you know, these guys, specifically the eastern indigos, they're, they're found in, you know, southeastern into central um, United States, down like Texas, Louisiana, Florida, um, and then down into Mexico and down into Central and South America for the Crevos. Um, but... In that range, essentially, what's really cool about the, and again, I'm mostly talking about the Eastern Indigos, they move. The Orion Society, which is a group dedicated to the protection of reptiles, but they do a lot with the Eastern Indigos and Louisiana Pine Snakes, they did a study and they found that a male indigo traveled over a full mile in a 24-hour period, which if you guys know anything about snakes, that's insane. And the reason why is because of their diets and their habits. These guys move. They are very active, large snakes that they will actually change their habitat throughout the year, essentially following the best, the best prey as well as the best areas for nesting and mating, which ends up leading to issues in a little bit that I will talk about. Um, and during that time, for the most part, it does vary and change, but for the most part, these guys are found in flat leaf and long leaf pine forests and savannas. It's very dry, sandy, drained soil. And that's in a lot of the places where gopher tortoises exist, as we talked about in the previous little part about this with the gopher tortoise, um, where they find a lot of their prey. And so during that part, while they're moving around a lot, they also require a lot of cover because even though they are large, they are still a snake and still a prey item for animals like birds of prey. And so with one, they're moving around through all this area, they need like the old long leaf pine, all of that for cover, the debris fields, a lot of like tall grass and things in the savanna, they all use that for cover while they're constantly moving, looking for prey. These guys are almost like, almost mammalian in some of their behavior versus like a lot of the reptiles and other snakes that we see, even with the more active colubrids. Um, really, really cool, cool, cool snakes. And so here's the thing about the Eastern Indigos. They are an endangered species, and there is a real reason for that. Um, and that is due to habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. So even though the Orient Society and a lot of other places like the Tennessee Zoo and other places in Georgia who do a lot of you know, conservation and do a lot of captive breeding and reintroduction, and they've managed to get pieces of land and area where it is good, sustainable area and environment and habitation for them to live at because the way these animals behave and move and travel, because they are so fragmented, it is really hard to establish long growth populations because they move. And when they try to move from one to another, they get killed in the Walmart parking lot along the way. All road. right, for my token lizard of the video, and I will do my best to try not to do that quite as much, but again, I favor snakes so much more, but I do want to give a wide variety. But so this one is a really cool lizard, and that is the spiny tail iguana. 
So we all know like the green iguanas, right? And some of us might even know about like the rhino iguanas, you know, because of like Barchek's rhino iguana and other things like that. But there are a group of animals that are native to North America, and there's actually even a desert iguana too, but the spiny-tailed iguanas. These guys are really cool. There's, I think, of the, I think 15 different species and several subspecies throughout that that range from essentially Mexico all the way down into Central and South America, mostly Central America. And they vary considerably. There are the smallest, which are the Yucatan ones, which are found in Mexico that they only average about 10 inches long. And the largest one, which are the black tails, which can get almost five feet in length, like a big male is almost five feet in length. These guys are really cool. They don't get quite as large as the green iguanas or the cyclora, the ground rock iguanas, but some of them can get substantial size like the blacks. But these guys are really cool display species and even a species, if you wanted to try to have really cool interactions like some of the cyclora and the green iguanas, you could. It just takes a little bit more patience. So being iguanids, or the iguana, so iguanid is the family of them. They are a herbivorous reptile, a herbivorous lizard. Although a lot of people, when they're raising them up, they will sprinkle in a little bit of uh, insects like um, green hornworms and crickets and roaches very, very liberally throughout their diet and as they get to adults it's pretty much all a wide variety of vegetables and flowers and a little bit of fruit. Um, some people I have heard that they will give pinkies to small ones without a whole lot of detriment but eh, I'm not a big fan of giving without like with the exception of monitors and tegus I really don't give a whole lot of actual rodents to them but burp, over there. These guys are really cool. Um, some of the species are starting to be threatened essentially due to habitat loss and for a long period of time, mostly through the 90s, um, over collecting in the pet trade or for just being poached for animal products. Um, but a lot of people now, Thai Park um, down in Florida, are doing a lot of really great captive breeding programs with these. So if you can, go check them out if that's something that's really cool. Um, these guys, like I said earlier, are a great species for display, but they are lizards and they do need a lot of space. Basically, even though there's a wide variety, a wide variety of the different species, so the size of enclosure is going to obviously change dramatically depending on which it is, it can be summed up with as these are big, sun-loving, moisture-loving dinosaurs. So if you're going to get one, make sure you get one that has lots of space, both wide and tall, because they are semi-arboreal, even the bigger ones. They like to climb up in trees. They like to bask. So whatever you're going to have, make sure you give them some big branches, give them some nice platforms to bask on, give them lots of UVB. Um, they will drink standing water but because they, they do do that. They are good swimmers as well. But they really like that morning mist. A lot of lizards really like that. So a lot of people who have them, especially if you're in a place like Florida or somewhere where it's nice more of the year. They like to miss a lot in the morning. They really like that, but always make sure you can give them a big, nice, heavy water dish that they can't knock over. These guys are a really cool species of animal, and honestly, I would really like one of these days to get one of the banana spiny tails. I can't quite remember off the top of my head um, the, the specific subspecies of them, but they're very closely related to the black and whites, the panda ones, and they get in that like four-ish foot long range. They're really, really cool and amazing displays. This species. last one is another species of snake, obviously, that I think is really cool, also obviously, that probably not a whole lot of people have heard about. And actually, the only reason why I heard about it is just because I happened to be talking to someone who by extension of a pod, like I was listening to a podcast and by extension of the actual animal that they were studying knows a lot about them. And that is the queen snake. So we all know the king snakes, right? The ones that get their name from eating the other snakes. Well, the queen snake is a little bit different. Queen snakes are really interesting. So obviously they're native to North America and essentially they occupy pretty much like all of middle America, like all of the temperate zone. So from like, you know, Western New York-ish to Wisconsin and then all the way down to like Alabama into like basically like the top panhandle of Florida. And the reason why they take up such this huge range is because of their diet. So when you look at a queen snake, you first think, oh, that's just a type of garter snake, right? Well, they are very closely related to them and their body type and their habitation. And because of that, and you know, they are built very similarly. But there's a few differences. So, you know, when you look at the body, it's that kind of dark olive green to almost chocolatey brown. But they do have those really nice, bold, 
the yellow stripes and they have some other stripes down at their vent, which makes a very distinguishing feature. But these guys are another type of semi-aquatic snake, just like the garter snake. They are oval vivarious, just like the garter snake. They're very small, only about two to two and a half feet long, like the garter snake. But here's where they differ. The queen snake is very special because 90% of their diet is crayfish or crawfish for someone who wants to yell at me. It's insane. These guys are really, really crazy. And the insane part is they're really only found where crayfish are found. So that means they need relatively warm water over 50-ish degrees. They need it clean because crustaceans have to have clean water to survive. And it needs to be just, and then they need to have rocky bottoms on the bottom of this clean, usually moving water because that's where crayfish like to hide and bury under, is under rock. So in this huge range, they only occupy very specific habitats because their requirements are what they need their crayfish to live in. And so when you find crayfish, you might find queen snakes. And that's actually where I learned about them was someone who was doing um, crayfish speciation or some study with a specific population of them in an area, which is kind of crazy. The other crazy part about the queen snake is that they seem to mostly eat freshly molted crayfish, which crayfish will shed and well, they molt just like a tarantula because they're just water bugs too. Um, they just, they will molt, but they seem to do it frequently twice a year. And so what they've actually found is that queen snakes sometimes really only eat and are active two different times a year. And the rest of the year, why they don't truly hibernate, because they do hibernate in also like a garter snake and the rattlesnakes, the, the hibernacula, where they group together in places and hibernate during the times where they're not eating, which occupies a good chunk of the year. They're, they're very lethargic, they're very slow, and even though they're not fully hibernating, you can still find them around. And actually during those time periods, crayfish will actually prey on them. So predator becomes prey during those times. But it's really crazy because we all think about snakes that they eat, you know, once a week one, or however many often we do. These guys, as well as several other species of snake out there, they really only seem to eat and be active when their prey source is there. So for like island localities that eat a lot of birds, they only eat when they come once a year and they just gorge themselves on the ground nesting birds. In the case of the queen snake, what they find is that when the crayfish are essentially molting in mass, they gorge themselves on the crayfish and the rest of the year they spend fairly docile, dormant, and things like that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. I think that, you know, all the reptiles in general are really cool. I know we like to poo-poo on some of them sometimes, including myself, even though I keep them all. Um, they are all really, really cool. And so that's why I like to do the five good pet reptiles because we all like to keep them because they're really cool, right? But just reptiles in general are really cool. And while a lot of them I don't think are best in captivity for you know 90% of the population out there or shouldn't be kept due to their requirements in the wild or their conservation status, things like that. They're just really cool and should be talked about as well. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please let me know down in the comments. You can email me, jzreptiles at gmail.com, jzs reptiles, because some jerk took jz reptiles a while ago and won't give me the thing, but whatever, may have you. Hopefully again, you guys did enjoy this. I sure have a whole lot of fun doing these things. Eventually, I like to do this full time where I just get to spend all of my time talking to people about reptiles and animals in general. If you guys are interested in any kind of like Zoom reptile education show or if you guys are local to Colorado, please email me about inquiries about possibly doing a reptile show for special events, birthdays, just a really cool thing, homeschool group, things like that. I'm starting to do that right now building up hopefully towards the future um, coming fall school year where I can do a little bit more of that in person as well. Again, thank you so much, especially you guys who do subscribe. It, it means a whole lot to me. It really does. That way I'm not just talking to my cell phone uh, right now. So again, thank you so much. Hope you're having a great day and we'll check you next time.